All right, so we'll go ahead and get the meeting kicked off. Uh, this is our last CAB meeting of 2020, so we made it. Um, it's been kind of a trying year uh, for, for everyone, uh, but we're starting to see the end of it and we'll be turning over uh, the calendar um, and, and we'll be discussing kind of how the CAB will look <laughs> as we get into 2021 uh, later in this meeting. Um, but we've got uh, some information uh, for everyone. We had uh, both James and Mike uh, present to this group a few months ago, uh, but they're back today um, with some updated information on what they've been working on. Uh, and I will hand it over to uh, Mike or James, uh, whoever wants to kind of kick it off first, uh, feel free, uh, you've got the floor. Okay, um, this is Mike Ripko. I'll, I'll tell you what we've been working on here. So uh, since September, we've been trying to assist the community to pursue some CARES Act funding for capital projects and workforce development projects. And um, our best count, you know, the, the submitters don't really have to tell us, but we, we at least have six projects submitted. Uh, some are multi-million dollar projects for pretty big things. Um, these projects are very attractive because they only require a 20% match rate as opposed to the EDA's normal 50% match rate. So it's a real good deal. Um, and everybody else in the country thought so too, uh, so much so that EDA was inundated with requests. And when we talked to our regional representative, Kyle Darton, uh, he said, you know, based on the number of requests for funding we have now, if we just have an average success rate, an average uh, that we typically have, we're out of money already. Now, this money was supposed to last us through uh, all of 21 into the fall of 22. So clearly, uh, for this uh, program to be as successful as is needed and to meet the, the needs of the region and the nation, uh, we're going to need another stimulus package. And of course, we see that on the news every day that they are. Uh, negotiating that in Congress. Uh, we've, of course, told our local representative, Congressman Ryan, as well as Senator Brown and Senator Portman staff that uh, we're anxious for additional funds for not only the Mahoning Valley, but for the region. So we'll see how that uh, is negotiated in the coming weeks. Um, we would have thought we would have heard by now on some of the projects, but as I said, uh, they've got to review them all before they decide who gets funded. That's the only fair thing to do. So uh, they're doing that. And uh, like many organizations, the holidays might slow them down. So uh, we don't know when we're going to hear. We don't know of any of our local projects that are funded yet. Um, but we'll keep an eye on an ear to that to make sure that we uh, communicate and take advantage of not only uh, those projects that were funded, uh, but uh, we'll also be advocating for an expansion of this CARES Act uh, of virus funding. If we don't get an expansion, we'll be back to the normal 50% cost share rate uh, that is typical on most of these EDA infrastructure projects. So if you've got projects or you know of projects, we, we need to keep writing, we need to keep doing, uh, but uh, uh, we, we may re, uh, require, or we will require more coronavirus funding at the uh, federal level in order to get that more attractive funding rate. So um, that's an update on what we've been doing. All right, well, I'll jump in there. Uh, what Mike's been working on primarily is the uh, EDA CARES Funding Act and uh, those grants from providing that assistance. And something that we'll be working on uh, here is uh, helping uh, provide assistance to those local communities uh, that are out there for some of the other funding opportunities or maybe just uh, uh, the applications themselves. I wanted to bring up that besides the EDA funding, there are also a number of other ones out there, uh, Department of Health and Human services uh, as well as FEMA. So some people have seen uh, announcements in the newspaper or on TV about uh, community development block grants that have been utilized by some of the larger cities here in Ohio uh, for direct assistance for programs uh, in response to the recovery. And uh, we'd like to make sure that folks realize that those are uh, funds that are out there. As Mike said, you know, the cost share uh, breakout is a little bit different now and, uh, you know, 
both Mike and myself and Justin would be happy to help uh, walk through any of those with any of the uh, communities that might be able to do that. With the uh, CDBG, obviously, that's not just the communities or the municipalities. There are also nonprofits that are eligible, in some cases, other private entities, uh, but uh, there's opportunity out there. And then I wanted to bring up also, you know, my main uh, role here is to provide that uh, uh, recovery plan and looking at what did we have in place and what do we need to have uh, for future response, but it's also in the response to the disaster. And in that, working with the state of Ohio EMA, there are some public assistance dollars that are available that will um, be out there. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the vaccine and how that will be distributed and how that will work in Ohio. Um, obviously, we're following uh, the national uh, strategy and uh, you know, they're saying up to uh, 300 million vaccines will be ready over the next six months. But now we're saying at least by January, it looks like probably earlier than that, we'll start seeing some distribution to those most at risk uh, populations. And that's going to be uh, completely provided by the uh, warp speed program and the federal government, the Operation Warp Speed. Uh, they'll be providing kits that includes the PPE, uh, the syringes, uh, and the vaccine itself, uh, largely at no cost to the folks that uh, will be receiving it. Uh, of course, there are some uh, cost reimbursements, other things we can work with if we have community health uh, departments that are doing some of that. The uh, Ohio National Guard will be working some of those in our region and uh, making sure that uh, the vaccine gets out in accordance with the national plan. And uh, we'll try to uh, help with that as well. For some of our more rural communities, still a little bit TBD about how that might work uh, and who might lead it. Was it going to be a private entity, hospitals, clinics, or is it going to be uh, perhaps the National Guard or some others? So some of that information should be coming out uh, soon, and then, as Mike alluded to, I think uh, with the uh, federal government seemingly coming to an agreement there in the House and the Senate about uh, a relief light program in the neighborhood of 800 billion, uh, there should be additional funds flowing to each one of these funding pipelines, like EDA and others. Uh, but right now, I think the most um, Interesting one is working with the Ohio Regional Northeast Region uh, Coordinator for EMA about getting the vaccine out and working with Operation Warp Speed and making sure that all of our citizens and people are able to get access to that vaccine uh, as it comes along. And Ohio is uh, working in lockstep. Uh, I had a few other notes, but I think I'll, I'll just kind of leave it there. There are a lot of questions I'm sure that are out there. Uh, you can see. You've got uh, my email and Mike's email. We'd be happy to uh, help out in any way we can, or I'll be happy to take any questions here should anyone have any. Looks like we had one come into the chat box uh, asking about warp speed. Um, and then if other countries are planning on using that since they seem to have fewer deaths uh, than we do here uh, in the United States, maybe just a little um, explainer on what Operation Warp Speed uh, kind of relates to and, and how that's factoring into the response. Yeah, if I could, uh, Operation Warp Speed is a whole of government plan that uh, the current administration put in place uh, months ago to respond to uh, the crisis and most specifically about how would we, once we get an approved vaccine, how would we get that out to the masses in an orderly process to serve uh, all the citizens across this great country. Uh, so it's DHS, Department of uh, Homeland Security, Health and Human Services, FEMA, the military, and it's led by a military uh, general, uh, but they're working with all the folks to include the NIH and you name it. Uh, everyone is out there working. How are we going to do this? Are we like other countries? I think we're going to see uh, the UK will be the first country that's going to have an approved vaccine, which is actually most likely going to be our first approved vaccine as well. Um, that will be administered here due to some, we'll say, less uh, stringent requirements there in the UK. They're probably going to beat us by a week to 10 days uh, before that's distributed. But we also have, as you, most of you know, two vaccines that are in the approval process now. Um, and uh, the military working with the airlines, and you name it, some of you have seen that uh, United Airlines flew in 
our first uh, two sets of vaccines uh, earlier this week. Uh, we're now in the neighborhood of, depending on who you believe, about 50 million vaccines uh, getting ready to enter the pipeline. And then how do we do that? What the military is doing is specializing in the logistics piece of making sure that, especially for that Pfizer one that has to be at that sub-zero temperature and maintain there of having special um, transportable equipment that will be able to get that out everywhere to include maybe places like Latonia or Jefferson uh, and make sure that the capacity for those uh, small clinics and uh, or pharmacies, you know, CVS and Walgreens are both going to be most likely on the distribution uh, chain here, much like they are for the flu vaccine and we're for H1N1. Uh, so all of those are involved in operational warp speed. So we have that public public partnership with all those uh, three digits that I talked about, as well as uh, the private entities out there from United Airlines to uh, Walgreens. So it's really pretty interesting seeing it come together in such a short period of time. It's uh, rather historical and uh, impressive that, you know, what the U.S. can put together when we really put our minds to it. Great. Uh, two follow up questions uh, in the chat box there. Uh, do you happen to know the general's name that's leading the operation? And then uh, is there any information on cost of the vaccine available yet? Looks like you uh, somehow got muted there, James. There you go. Did I mute me or did you unmute me? <laughs> but uh, I was saying the uh, uh, vaccine is going to essentially be free for everyone in the United States. Uh, however, uh, Medicare, Medicaid, private insurers, everything will run the gamut of who's going to pay for it initially, just very similar to the flu vaccine. Uh, and the federal government will reimburse those that are uh, providing that. Um, so for most of us that are on the call, we probably have some sort of private health insurance or Medicare, Medicaid, that's going to help provide that initial piece. And then uh, the federal government is also guaranteed through the CARES, Initial CARES uh, Act, that that coverage will carry for all those uninsured folks as well, and there will be a uh, reimbursement plan in place for um, those providers that provide it to someone without an eligible insurance. Excellent. I don't see anything else in the chat box. Uh, does anybody else have any questions? All right. Well, I think, uh, you know, thank you both James and Mike uh, for giving us your reports. Uh, a lot of interesting information. Uh, you know, it's particularly interesting for myself just, you know, to see the agency kind of branch out in these directions and be able to take on these kind of new programs to, to touch areas that we haven't in the past and, and really uh, help move some of these um, initiatives forward. So thanks for sharing. Thank you. All right, uh, we will keep moving with our uh, agenda. Uh, so I'm going to give everyone an update on our planning grant program. Uh, so we're working Justin? on. Yes. Yeah, Justin, before you go on, I think I was muted. I typed into the chat box another question uh, that might be beyond the scope of uh, the uh, uh, discussion uh, from from Jim. Um, my question is, could our air base and airport become a national strategic stockpile warehouse center, given its central location and proximity to uh, uh, a good highway network? Yeah, that's a, a great question. Uh, some of the discussion went on uh, with the Ohio National Guard, and uh, as you might have seen, the first two flights that came into the United States uh, went to Chicago. There are a couple different reasons why that happened, primarily because of FEMA's response capabilities uh, out of that sector. Uh, so right now, they're they're not looking at uh, the Youngstown Air Reserve Station uh, as a node. 
they are looking at uh, Rickenbacker down at Columbus as one of those for the state of Ohio, uh, and Pittsburgh is uh, another one. Uh, but right now, it looks like the bulk of the uh, vaccines will start and be distributed through, at least initially, through Chicago. So I'm talking beyond that, uh, looking at a permanent government national strategic stockpile warehouse being built there because of its central location. Well, I love the idea. We'll uh, we'll keep uh, working with our policymakers there in uh, in D.C. to see if uh, we can encourage them to agree to the same. Thank you. Uh, excellent questions, Pete. Thank you. Okay, so uh, we are opening up the next round of our planning grant funding. Uh, for those of you that have uh, been involved and been around, uh, we've done two previous rounds of this program uh, before. Uh, this is something that the agency sets up. Uh, we take $30,000 of our planning funding that comes in uh, from Federal Highway and kind of set it aside right at the beginning of the year um, with the intention that uh, we can kind of distribute these funds to local communities to do planning work. Um, the last two rounds uh, that we held this program, we were able to fund three projects each round, uh, which is way more than we had envisioned when we uh, wanted to implement this program initially. Uh, we thought, you know, maybe one project for 30,000 was going to take it, uh, but the scoring committees that we set up both times uh, decided that the best way to distribute those funds uh, was to kind of break it up and, and award multiple projects, uh, which I think is a, a, a great uh, kind of feature of this program is that it's got that flexibility. Uh, so I'll talk about how this year's program is going to work. Um, for the most part, we're keeping a lot of things the same. Uh, what the program is focused on, uh, you can see there on the screen that there's um, kind of some bullet points that talk about, you know, what's the idea behind this? What do we want uh, communities to focus on uh, when being given this, this funding? And, and the heart of this is that it's a transportation funding program. Uh, so transportation planning is what we're pushing here. Uh, but more so than that, we're targeting it down to active transportation. So walking, biking, taking the bus, um, anything that deals with accessibility um, and really getting more people to the places they need to go easier. Uh, so you'll see some of the principles there, um, active transportation, complete streets, land use and community design, all of those things work in uh, tandem together. Economic development uh, can be a huge driver of active transportation. Um, if we're developing our places in certain ways, we can uh, really foster um, places where people want to be able to move uh, by walking or biking or um, using transit. Uh, capital improvement plans are eligible for this program. Uh, so that's something where a community can take a look uh, at their infrastructure uh, and, and kind of set a goal in mind that they have several years out uh, and figure out what it's going to cost to maintain it or upgrade it uh, and put together those pieces of the plan, figure out where they need to chase funding from, how much they're going to need. Uh, is some of that capable of uh, being leveraged with federal or state funding? How much local money are they going to need to be able to kind of balance that out and, and match all of that? And lastly, quality of life is the last principle. I think, um, you know, when you're talking active transportation, uh, you could just kind of strictly put your blinders on and focus on the data of, you know, how many people are walking or biking and, um, you know, really kind of get too lost in the weeds. But really what all this relates to is uh, we're helping people get around. Uh, all of these data points and all of these numbers go back to quality of life and, and how people move about their, their uh, community. Uh, so really wanting to improve on that and use this program as that leverage point. Uh, so for eligibility, because this is federal dollars coming in, um, the lead applicant has to be the community, uh, but that does not dissuade 
community groups like neighborhood organizations or CDCs or um, other groups that are interested in kind of pursuing these planning topics from being the main drivers of this work. Uh, the only kind of limitation on that is that those groups would have to work with the municipality that they're um, kind of doing the planning work for. Uh, so I think this is a great opportunity in building those connections and building those bridges, uh, maybe in some communities that uh, haven't necessarily uh, been able to get in a room together with either their city council person or their township trustee or, um, you know, whoever's in charge of that infrastructure that uh, maybe the neighborhood doesn't uh, necessarily feel is uh, most optimal for what they'd like to see. Uh, so this could be a way to, to bridge the community and the municipalities together. Um, and I'd love to see some projects come in where uh, there's some community support and community buy-in, and maybe it's fully community driven. I think, you know, that uh, kind of, to me, be the pinnacle of what could come out of this program. Uh, so we'll take a look at the program schedule. Um, the pre-applications are due January 15th. Uh, so we make this pre-application process super easy. Uh, essentially, it is letting us know who's interested and what the idea is. Uh, just a very high level description of what uh, community wants to focus on for this project and this application. Uh, so when that comes into us, we're able to take a scan through it, um, maybe get together a one on one meeting with the applicant uh, to make sure that they are able to put together the strongest application they can and that they can be competitive uh, because we really want to see um, competitive projects come out of this program. And even if we can't fund everything, we want to make sure that the projects are um, kind of identified in a way that we may be able to pivot those into other programs. Um, last year, I believe Liberty Township had applied uh, for the planning grant funding, um, didn't end up uh, being selected uh, to receive the funding, but what we did was we spun that off into our corridor planning program, and we essentially covered the project that they wanted to look at uh, within that program. Um, there's a few other examples where uh, communities have applied and maybe we uh, say we see that their idea is kind of fleshed out enough that we can go straight to funding and we can recommend them to our uh, transportation alternatives program or our CMAC funding or a different one of our pots and programs. Um, and maybe, uh, you know, it doesn't go to us at all. Maybe it's something that we refer to, um, you know, ODOT safety program and there's a safety study done. Uh, so there's a lot of extra options. And I think just getting these idea in uh, is really what we're pushing for. And we, and we wanna make sure that people are um, able to really think about what's meaningful and, and what's important to them as communities. Uh, so after that pre-application process, we'll have a full application that's a little more detailed, a little more specific, and that's what's going to end up being looked at by our scoring committee. Uh, so we'll take those full applications, we'll do a quick check, make sure everything's there, and then we pass it off to our scoring committee. And our scoring committee is made up um, of a few members. So we have a representative from both the city of Warren and the city of Youngstown, uh, Mahoning County, Trumbull County, uh, ODOT and someone from the Citizens Advisory Board. Uh, so at the end of this, I'm going to kind of open up the call. Uh, I'll send out an email afterwards and we'll kind of uh, open that up to uh, the members of the CAB. Um, but how the scoring committee uh, will work this year is a little bit different than last year. Uh, last year, we had everybody get together. Uh, same with the year prior. Um, in a room, they were able to review all the projects beforehand and then discuss them uh, in this kind of in-person meeting and really hash out the scoring and figure out what projects they felt were best suited. Uh, this year, uh, due to the pandemic, you know, everything's going to be remote and um, kind of separate this year, which I think could pose um, a, a few complications, but we'll make it as easy as possible. Uh, essentially, there's going to be a scoring sheet uh, set up and uh, the, the, ref the scoring committee will receive all the applications, be able to read through them, go through a scoring rubric and send us back their scores. Uh, everything will be anonymous, so there's no, uh, you know, 
tracing scores back to an indiv individual scoring committee member. So there's, uh, you know, some safeguards in place there, uh, but we'll have enough information at that point to um, kind of tally all those results. We'll go back to the scoring committee to let them know how the numbers worked out, get the okay from them, and then we'll send it through our board structure to get approved. Um, and then July 1st, those projects will kick off uh, and they're able to go wild. Um, and then all for a June 30th, 2022 turnaround to get a final plan. So um, this schedule has worked pretty well. Um, we haven't had many issues with uh, communities kind of failing to, to get these done or, or turned around in time. Um, and we've gotten some great projects out of it that have ended up you know, going for funding through our programs uh, after they finish this process. And that's what we want to see. We want to see these projects go from the planning to implementation stage pretty seamlessly. Uh, and we, our staff is, is right there for any of the communities to, to help them along the way. Uh, so really, I urge you all, if, if you have ideas or um, maybe you don't have ideas, but you want to see your communities um, start to think in this way and do this type of work, uh, reach out to your trustees and your council people um, and let them know that this program's available. Uh, you know, we send this out to our contact list that covers just about every jurisdiction, but, you know, maybe it doesn't hit the right person or the, you know, person with the ideas doesn't uh, necessarily receive that messaging. So uh, if you've got some thoughts or you want to see your community uh, kind of chase this funding, um, feel free to direct them my way. I'm happy to meet with anyone at any time to talk about, um, you know, this program and, and how we can make it a possibility for those communities. And as always on our website, we've got all the information there. Uh, we've got information on the past projects that were awarded funding, um, everything for the program guide uh, that has all the nitty gritty details about what the program is specifically about, uh, all up on the website. Um, and like I said, after the meeting, I will send out an email to the CAB, the current CAB members to have them select someone uh, or have someone volunteer to uh, be the scoring committee member. Um, depending on the type of response uh, I get, it may, you know, I'll kind of pick the people that respond to us and, and uh, we'll have a discussion then about uh, who wants to be the, the scoring committee member. But, um, I appreciate the committee's uh, participation in previous years. Uh, it's always been pretty smooth and, and we've had uh, some great outcomes from it. Uh, does anybody have any questions about the planning grant uh, for this coming year? Just an observation, uh, and that is that uh, speaking of a project that has uh, come to fruition, uh, if you've been downtown at all recently, you've noticed the uh, bike trail under construction along Mahoning Avenue, West Avenue, and uh, Todd Avenue, and that, of course, is connecting downtown to Mill Creek Park. Yeah, it's an exciting project going live, uh, kind of watching it unfold. Um, the occasions that I make it downtown uh, but yeah, a, a great example of a type of project that could be um, examined through this program. All right. Uh, next up on the agenda, uh, general policy board. So we do have a policy board meeting coming up in January. Uh, it's at the end of the month. So we'll have one more CAB meeting before we get there. Uh, but just to kind of um, put this out there. Uh, if anybody has any suggestions for um, information to include in the Citizens Advisory Board report, uh, feel free to let me know. I can uh, make sure to get that in there and make sure we cover it uh, in our report out. Uh, and also, if you would like to attend, uh, let me know and I can put you on the list to, to get the connection information and um, make sure you're able to be present for that meeting. Moving on to policy board resolutions, uh, we don't have anything this month. Uh, I, I don't think we had anything last month either. So it's been kind of a slow uh, couple months, but uh, if anything changes or anything comes up uh, over the next couple weeks, I'll be sure to 
uh, send out an email to the committee members uh, to have them review and discuss those. Uh, and moving on into our announcements portion uh, of the meeting. So uh, kind of been pushing this for the last couple months, but membership uh, for 2021. I've uh, been sending out the survey and got some good responses back. Uh, so you'll see on the screen, we've got kind of two categories here. We've got members that have applied to be returning members for 2021. Uh, so very gracious for all of you that have chosen to stick around and continue to uh, want to be involved and participate. Uh, and we have two new members that have applied. Um, and I believe they are both on the call. Uh, so, Lois or Samantha, I'll give you the opportunity. If you would like to introduce yourself, feel free. There's no pressure, uh, you know, certainly not necessary. But if you'd like to, feel free to unmute and uh, introduce yourselves. Yeah, absolutely. Hi, everyone. My name is Samantha Yanucci. I'm, I'm from the area. I recently moved back at the end of April um, due to the pandemic. I was living in Amsterdam just prior to coming back here. But yeah, I have um, I have a discipline that my background is in urban plan, urban and regional planning. So I'm really excited to join these meetings and just see, you know, what we could do and to make this area more livable, more walkable, bikeable, just have better mobility. And yeah, uh, thanks for having me on the call today. Yeah, I'm LK Williams and yeah, I wanted to join because I, I'm interested in the environment. I'm a member of Friends of the Mahoning River, and yeah, it was suggested that yeah I join. So I'm happy to be a part of the group. I don't have as much to say as Samantha. Uh, I'm kind of new to the area, ten years here, but uh, that's not very long when you when it comes to Youngstown. Well, excellent. Uh, it's it's great to have you both with us. Um, how we will work with this is uh, I will send out. Uh, in that same email, that follow up email to the CAB, the current CAB members, I will send out this list of names uh, and just ask them to kind of approve the slate of 2021 members. Uh, and we will have everyone kind of transition over nicely into 2021. Uh, so thank you all for replying. Um, I'm not going to cut off the membership application. So if we missed people, if people didn't get their applications in in time, um, you know, we can roll that over into the first couple months of next year. Uh, all we really expect out of members in the bylaws is that they attend three meetings a year. Uh, so I will keep the membership application open for 2021 membership um, at least through July or August uh, next year, I think. Uh, because that would still give people enough time to kind of fulfill that attendance requirement. Um, so if you're on the call and maybe you uh, didn't get in in this first round, never fear. You know, I'll keep checking that survey and uh, as people uh, send in their applications, um, you can feel free to submit yours and, uh, you know, we'll get you in at some point in the year. So uh, thank you to all of you that filled that out. Um, this is Jim. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I would like to apply. I missed it. I guess I had a really busy year with all of our COVID stuff, but I do want to apply again for next year. I've been on in the past and I so apparently didn't make three meetings this year. I don't know if I did or not, but okay. I kind of gave everyone a pass this year. Uh, it's <laughs> kind of been a little difficult to track attendance in this virtual capacity. Yeah. Um, I've been kind of just making tally marks and, and keeping track as best I can. So I gave everyone a pass this year. Um, we'll, we'll figure out the attendance thing, I think. Thank you. <laughs> we keep moving on, but uh, I'll include uh, your information, your name, uh, since you were a member this year. Um, yeah. In that follow up email, so you'll be you'll be good to go. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, the only thing else uh, regarding membership is board leadership. Uh, so, chair, vice chair, and then we have four people uh, that are general policy board representatives. We have uh, a rep from Mahoning and Trumbull County, as well as an alternate for either of them. Um, so, we won't decide anything on this today. Uh, a few of you I built into the cert, the application uh, if you are interested in holding any of these positions. Um, so, a few of you have, have marked down that you're interested in that, so that's great. Um, 
what we'll do is uh, at the next meeting kind of make a decision on this. So if anybody is interested in holding uh, one of these leadership positions, um, just send me an email which one you're kind of interested in. If you're interested in all of them, that's great. We can kind of put you up and then uh, see how things filter out from there. Uh, but the board will make a decision at the January meeting uh, or shortly after we'll do it via email because I think that's a little easier uh, than this setup and format. Um, so open to any uh, CAB member, Kevin, I think uh, you kind of got shortchanged on the chair duties uh, this year with the pandemic kind of sidelining a lot of that. So uh, it you know, the count that much this year. <laughs> right, right. Um, so yeah, uh, anybody that's interested in any kind of board leadership, feel free to send an email to me. I'll make sure to uh, keep track of all of that and we'll uh, have that discussion at the next month's meeting so that we're not kind of overburdening um, too many decisions at one time. Uh, but as far as our agenda, that's all we've got. Uh, Tom, I see uh, you have posted a question. Any news on the Mahoning River study? Uh, so I got in touch with Joanne. She said they're still just accepting the responses. Uh, so anybody that wants to go to mymahoningriver.com, I believe. Let me check that real quick. Yes, mymahoningriver.com. Uh, they have a survey and an interactive mapping tool uh, up that you are able to um, kind of just submit your feedback and your uh, comments and questions uh, through that process. Um, I have not heard when that's going to wrap up, uh, but I think either January or February, and we will have someone from that group that's working on this project uh, uh, come in to kind of present where they're at and, and give kind of an update. Uh, Dwayne, mm -hmm. good question. Is being chairman of the Trumbull County Transit Board a conflict? Uh, no, uh, the great thing about the Citizens Advisory Board is that it's open to anyone regardless of what you do kind of during the day. So uh, everyone's a resident, uh, everyone's kind of a, a private citizen. So uh, being on this board uh, wouldn't be a conflict. Um, so yeah, you're you're more than welcome to, to join us as a member if, if that's something you're interested in. Any other comments, questions, thoughts, complaints, gripes, discussion? All right. Uh, so that's all we've got uh, for this meeting this month. Um, thank all of you for uh, joining us uh, continuously. Uh, you know, I know we've kind of you know, dealt with the pandemic in the best way that we can, and this this setup isn't uh, optimal for discussion or, or having, you know, very deep conversations and, and doing what this committee, I think, does best is is really getting together and uh, communicating well. So I, I, I'm i excited for the prospect of us, uh, you know, getting back to that at some time in the future uh, with James talking about the distribution of a vaccine. Uh, so hopefully, you know, all of that comes sooner rather than later and we're able to um, get back to our normal operations. I think, uh, you know, the next few months we'll still be meeting uh, in this capacity uh, in this format. Um, so we'll have to deal with this for a little bit longer. Um, our reminder should say 2021. I want to get this year over with. I don't want to repeat it. <laughs> good catch, good catch. Uh, so let's not start this year over again. Uh, <laughs> But uh, like always, if you got, if any of you have any thoughts uh, or comments about how we could be doing things different, any ideas on information you'd like to hear at these meetings, or uh, if you think we could try and do some discussion on certain topics, completely open to hearing any ideas uh, you all have. Um, Y'all are a great group, and uh, just reflecting back on the last year, uh, you know, this is my favorite part of my job is you know getting to host these meetings and. and come and talk to all of you. So uh, excited to start the next year with a, a 
good suite of uh, good people for uh, our membership. And uh, that's all I've got for you tonight. So I, I wish everyone, you know, a safe and happy holiday. Um, and until next time. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.